Good afternoon. I'm Katherine Santoro, Director of Policy and Development at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. And on behalf of NICAM, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. We're pleased to have an excellent panel of experts with us to share their perspectives on this very important topic and to highlight several innovative efforts to reverse opioid abuse trends. Before we hear from them, I'd like to thank NICAM's President and CEO, Nancy Chalkley, who led the development of today's webinar, as well as the NICAM staff who helped convene this event, including Kate Ellis, Katie McDonald, Carolyn Myers, and Kirsten Wade. You can find biographical information for all of our speakers, along with today's agenda and copies of slides on our website. We also invite you to live tweet during the webinar today using the hashtag RxAbuse. I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Cece Spitznas, Senior Science Policy Advisor in the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which is part of the Executive Office of the President. She provides policy analysis and scientific advice to the ONDCP Director and Chief of Staff on special matters of concern such as emerging drug trends and demand reduction, and helps to develop legislative responses to problems of national scope, particularly on opioids and prescription drugs. With the President's recent announcements on new public and private sector efforts to address the prescription drug and heroin epidemic, this is an incredibly busy time for her office, so we're honored that she's with us today. Cece? Thank you, Catherine, for that kind introduction, and to Nickum for sponsoring this event. I'm going to be talking today about federal initiatives for prescription opioids and heroin. In 1999, there was one drug overdose death every 30 minutes. In 2013, there was one drug overdose every 12 minutes. In addition to our concern about overdose, there are other medical consequences such as substance use disorders and the development of neonatal abstinence syndrome that are of concern. This slide illustrates the change in neonatal abstinence syndrome from 2000 to 2009. This is a syndrome that many babies who have been exposed to drugs during pregnancy experience following birth when they withdraw from medications and from illicit drugs. The change in NAS in 2009 to 2012 was also pronounced. The NAS incidence increased from 2.4 to 5.8 per 1,000 births. On average, this is one infant born every 20 minutes in the United States with the syndrome. The highest prevalence of this problem is in the southern states, followed by New England. And these, are, these um, infants are causing um, increases in the cost to both hospitals and state Medicaid programs. Our office, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, is a component of the Executive Office of the President, and we coordinate drug control activities and funding across the federal government. By statute, we engage in three primary efforts to guide the drug policy. We develop the National Drug Control Strategy, which is a document that sets forth a comprehensive plan each year to reduce the availability of drugs and the consequences of drug use in the United States. We develop a consolidated National Drug Control Program budget for federal agencies to implement the strategy and we coordinate and oversee the implementation by the federal drug control program agencies of the policies, goals, objectives, and priorities established for the National Drug Control Program and the fulfillment of the responsibilities of such agencies under the strategy. The National Drug Control Strategy includes the, science, the President's science-based plan to reform drug policy, uh, one element of that is preventing drug use before it ever begins through education. A second one concerns expanding access to treatment for Americans struggling with substance use disorders. A third includes reforming our criminal justice system. And the fourth includes supporting Americans in recovery. The 2010 National Drug Control Strategy included three signature initiatives that are, um, are definitely still of concern today. The one I will be talking the most about today concerns prescription drug abuse. And in 2011, we went on to develop a prescription drug abuse prevention plan. 
Now, some other, some opioid use relevant elements of the 2010 strategy included early intervention, treatment and recovery, and family-based treatment. And the family-based treatment is particularly important for helping pregnant women, um, women who have just given birth, um, to be able to deal with their substance use disorder. Um, we also included naloxone for first responders, including law enforcement. Naloxone is a, a tool that can be used to reverse an overdose from an opioid. And we also included um, support for, um, for syringe exchange services in that 2010 strategy. Now, in 2011, we wrote a standalone plan, the Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Plan, and that coordinated efforts across the federal government in four focus areas. The first is education, and we were largely concerned about prescriber education in that, um, in that initial pillar. The next one concerned prescription drug monitoring programs and trying to expand the number of prescription drug monitoring programs that were available in the United States. Um, each state currently, except for Missouri, now has a prescription drug monitoring program. And we're working on trying to expand interoperability between states um, and also interoperability with existing electronic health records so that providers can use these as tools to check on and monitor their patients. We are also interested in improving storage and disposal of medication, and a third or fourth pillar of this was enforcement of existing laws and expanding laws and policies to help monitor um, overprescribing of medications. Now, obviously, there's a number of different um, different things that can be done related to um, to some of the consequences that we're starting to see from this problem. Um, we're very interested, obviously, in the non-medical use of prescription drugs and the diversion of those drugs uh, and trying to prevent that. Um, we're interested in overdose education and naloxone distribution because we think that those are um, some good ways to try to turn the tide on overdose. We're interested also in earlier treatment as prevention. Obviously, it's a lot less expensive and can result in um, a lot better patient outcomes if people can be treated before they start to inject um, or before they start to use heroin or exposed to fentanyl, and fentanyl is a growing threat that we're seeing. Um, obviously, we're also interested in public health prevention interventions for hepatitis C and HIV. And one of the things that we're, um, we're very interested in is expanding access to medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, um, as well as maternal and infant um, best practices and establishing those to help to deal with NAF. So as, uh, as Catherine mentioned, I think, earlier, uh, President Barack Obama visited a, um, a treatment organization um, in West Virginia and held a community forum last week. And this is a, just a quote from him. Um, it touches everybody, from celebrities to college students to soccer moms to inner city kids, white, black, Hispanic, young, old, rich, poor, urban, suburban, men and women. It can happen to a coal miner. It can happen to a construction worker, a cop, a woman who is taking painkillers for work-related injury. It could happen to the doctor who writes him the prescriptions. And here's a photo from the, uh, the forum. And the lady to the right was chosen as a representative for all of the parents who have had this type of experience. Um, Dr. Uh, Director Botticelli and Secretary Burwell both attended this forum, and if you're interested, the White House YouTube channel has a video of the event. We were very happy that the President took time out to come and talk about this. Um, as part of the activities, we released a fact sheet that's on our website and uh, a presidential memorandum to address prescription, opioid, prescription drug abuse and heroin use. And the purpose of this was really to help reduce prescription pain medication and heroin-related overdose deaths and to promote appropriate and effective prescribing of pain medications and increase, and increase access or improve access to treatment. So there are several components to this memorandum that I'm going to talk about. And um, essentially, what this is really focused on is trying to make sure that we and the federal government are doing everything that we can to make sure that our, um, our agencies and policies are aligned to support um, the 
the goals of the National Drug Control Strategy and the Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Plan, and also the Secretary Burwell's Opioid Initiative, which Grant will be talking about. So a big component of this involves training and ensuring that the executive departments and agencies provide training on appropriate and effective prescribing of opioids. So all employees who are healthcare professionals who prescribe controlled substances as part of their federal responsibilities and duties, and contractors who spend 50% or more of their time under contract with their federal government prescribing controlled substances, um, will, and as well as clinical residents um, and other trainees who spend 50% or more of their time in clinical practice in an executive department or agency facility, will receive training on um, safe opioid prescribing. Also, as part of this memorandum, agencies that directly provide health care services, contract to provide health care services, request or reimburse for health care services, or facilitate access to health care benefits are being ordered to review their health benefit requirements, their drug formularies, program guidelines, medical management strategies, drug utilization review programs, and other relevant policy tools and strategies. And the review will also identify current practices that are inconsistent with the goals of reducing opioid use disorders and overdoses. Action plans that address barriers and practices identified in the reviews are going to be developed and submitted to the directors of the White House Domestic Policy Council and ONDCP, our agency. Um, so this will include federal health care plans for federal employees and their families, and we think that this is a very um, helpful and important potential initiative. In addition, the President made a number of announcements uh, that appear in this fact sheet that is referenced at the bottom of this slide, and these concern um, federal actions that federal agencies are going to take things that are going to be in the 2016 budget, as well as state and local and private sector commitments. And I'm going to go, not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to go through um, a few of them just to give you a flavor of what we're going to be um, trying to do in the next few years. So uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is going to undertake a, a review of how pain ma management is evaluated by patient satisfaction surveys, which are used in hospitals and by other healthcare providers, including a review of how the questions these surveys use to assess pain management may relate to pain management practices and opioid prescribing. Um, CDC is going to invest um, more money on development of tools and resources to help inform prescribers about appropriate opioid prescribing, and I'll let Grant talk about that a little bit more. HHS is launching hhs.gov backslash opioids as a one-stop federal resource with tools and information for families, healthcare providers, law enforcement, and other stakeholders on prescription drug abuse and heroin use. CMS is going to release an informational bulletin to states by the end of the year on steps states can take through their Medicaid preferred drug lists and other utilization management mechanisms to reduce the risk of overdose. This is going to include a recommendation that they consider removing methadone for pain management from their preferred drug list. And the Department of Veteran Affairs will lead a research initiative to evaluate non-opioid alternatives to pain management. The White House is going to host a Champion of Change event this spring to highlight individuals and communities across the country who are leading the fight to respond to prescription drug abuse. And we have a number of initiatives that are related to um, working in the community to prevent opioid overdose and, and um, respond to it. This includes that the Department of Justice and 49 states um, will have established prescription drug monitoring programs. I mentioned that earlier. Um, there is going to be a number of um, two more take-back days that are going to be hosted by DEA. Looking for ones that are very relevant to you. Um, HHS has um, recently awarded $11 million in new grants to states to support MAT and um, $1.8 million to help communities purchase naloxone and train first responders. And this fall, CMS will be testing three new Medicare prescription drug plan measures designed to identify potential opioid overutilization with the goal of proposing publicly reportable measures for Part D plans next year. 
these are just a, a few examples of things that are, are being done as a part of this initiative. Um, we also announced a number of different, um, different public affairs types of, um, of activities that um, private agencies will be doing. For example, Google and the New York Times will be doing some um, additional um, media campaign types of activities. So um, I would encourage you all to take a look at uh, this information um, on the ONDCP website and, um, and to take a look at the fact sheet because I think that the fact sheet has a lot of, um, of real specific um, concrete examples of what you might be interested in um, as far as these um, new initiatives are concerned. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Grant Baldwin. Thank you so much, Dr. Spitznet. Um, as CC mentioned, uh, the CDC is just one of several federal agencies charged with implementing uh, the strategies and plans uh, that were just highlighted. And our next speaker joining us from CDC is Dr. Grant Baldwin, Director of the Division of Unintentional Injury Prevention at the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at CDC. This division is dedicated to reducing the number and severity of unintentional injuries through science-based programs and applied research and includes a focus on preventing prescription drug overdoses. <clears throat> We're so pleased Dr. Baldwin is with us today to share CDC's efforts. Thank you, Kat Catherine, and good afternoon, everybody. It's certainly a pleasure to be with you today. I will share with you the latest data on the public health burden of prescription drug and heroin-related overdoses, building on what Dr. Spitznas said. As she said, we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic, driven largely by the overprescribing of opioid pain relievers in the treatment of chronic pain. More recently, the sharp rise in heroin-related overdose deaths is a new and frankly not entirely unrelated development in an epidemic that's impacting every corner of our great country. I'll also briefly discuss two of CDC's signature initiatives to address the epidemic, implementing the Prevention for States Cooperative Agreement Program and developing prescribing guidelines for primary care practitioners for the treatment of chronic pain outside of active cancer, palliative, and end-of-life care. As CC said, here are details about Secretary Burwell's HHS initiative. She recently announced a targeted department-wide initiative aimed at reducing prescription opioid and heroin-related overdose, death, and dependence. It includes three priority areas, including one, providing training and education or educational resources to health professionals, including developing prescriber guidelines to assist providers in making informed prescribing decisions and address inappropriate use of opioids. Two, increasing access and use of naloxone. And finally, expanding the use of medication-assisted treatment, such as buprenorphine and methadone, in combination with counseling and other behavioral therapies to treat substance abuse disorders. So here's, so what do we know now? More than 145,000 people have died from overdoses involving prescription opioid pain relievers in the last decade, and deaths have quadrupled since 1999. While opioid pain relievers can and do play an important role in the management of some types of pain, the overprescribing of these powerful drugs created this epidemic. Opioid pain relievers such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, and methadone are responsible for driving the dramatic increase in overdose deaths. The yellow line shows the fourfold increase in deaths since 1999. In 2013, over 16,000 people died from a prescription opioid overdose, or about one death in every 33 minutes. Notice the slight plateauing of the yellow line in recent years. Beginning in 2012, deaths dropped for the first time since the 90s. Nearly 1,000 fewer people died from a prescription opioid in 2012 compared to the year before. But that said, the data showcase another troubling trend, the recent alarming increase in heroin overdose deaths. When you look at the total impact of opioid use, a staggering number of Americans are impacted. In 2011, for every one overdose death involving opioids, there were 12 substance abuse treatment admissions. 25 emergency department visits for misuse or abuse, 105 people who met criteria for abuse or dependence on opioids, 
and 659 people, 12 and older, who reported using these drugs non-medically. One quarter of a billion. Providers wrote more than a quarter of a billion opioid prescriptions in 2012. This is enough for every American adult, all of us on this webinar, and the other 240 million Americans over the age of 18 to have our own bottle of pills. This is twice as many opioid prescriptions per person compared to our neighbors to the north in Canada. One driver of the increase in opioid overdose deaths is the abundance of supply of these very powerful drugs. This graph shows the relationship between the sales of opioids, the green line, and the number of deaths from them, the blue line. As you can see, as the amounts of opioids sold increased, so did the number of deaths. The supply of opioid pain relievers is larger than ever. The quantity sold in 2011 was four times that sold in 1999. There is wide state variation in overdose death rates. The darker the shade of blue, the worse the rate on this map. What is unique about this figure is that we've overlaid the opioid pain reliever sales rates on the map. The sales figures are the yellow bubbles. The larger the bubble, the greater the sales. While not perfect, note how the states with the highest death rates also tend to have the highest sales rates. If the 2013 national drug overdose death rate of 13.8 per 100,000 people was reduced to the lowest state-based rate observed in North Dakota, almost 9,000 more Americans would have been alive in that year alone. So who's at greatest risk for an overdose? Rates of opioid use and overdose death are highest among men, people in their working years of life, and non-Hispanic whites. Poor and rural populations are, in general, more likely to experience prescription overdoses. People who have a mental illness or a co-occurring non-opioid substance use issue are overrepresented among both those non-medically using opioids and those overdosing on them. So what is CDC doing about it? Well, we aim to complement the work of our sister agencies within HHS and focus on CDC niche activities. To this end, we have three areas of focus. They are improve data quality and track trends to monitor the epidemic, strengthen state efforts by scaling up effective public health interventions, and enhancing patient safety by supplying healthcare providers with data, tools, and guidance for evidence-based decision making. Next, I'll outline our highest priority work, how our highest priority work is meeting these objectives. We are making a difference in states. This September, we launched the Prevention for States Cooperative Agreement Program. The program is a culmination of years of work with states. A total of 16 states were funded, an average of $875,000 per year for four years. States were selected based on a number of evaluation criteria. Most notably, states were competitively chosen based upon a high drug overdose mortality rate and their capacity to do something about the problem. We say at the intersection of burden and readiness. While states are required to implement some known effective strategies, and I'll talk more about those in a minute, the funding does give states the flexibility to tailor their work to. We've structured the PFS program to best advance two main goals. Hone in on key, high-impact, data-driven activities that address the epidemic on multiple fronts, and provide states with the flexibility needed to tailor a prevention program that fits the problem in their state and reflects their judgment about how to tackle this complex problem. There are four priority strategies in PFS, two required and two optional. States are required to enhance and maximize their prescription drug monitoring programs and implement community or insurer health system interventions. This includes things like moving towards universal PDMP registration and use, having a real-time PDMP where a prescription is almost instantaneously added to the PDMP when filled, expanding proactive reporting to target high-risk inappropriate prescribing, and linking PDMP and health outcome data. An example of a health system intervention might include adding or strengthening the state's Medicaid PRR, or Patient Review and Restriction Program, where high-risk patients are limited to one doctor and one pharmacy for their opioid prescriptions. While not required, states can also advance policy evaluations. For example, evaluate a pill mill law or Good Samaritan law or other policy or regulation aimed at curbing the epidemic. Finally, there are the rapid response projects. 
This gives states the flexibility on a year-over-year -year basis to redirect and target a hotspot area or issue. As CC mentioned, the current fentanyl outbreak is a good example of what a state might want to use their rapid response project to address. Certainly, we're eager to document and track the impact of the program and prove that it's a best buy to the American people. To do this, we've created clear metrics about how we expect change to occur. We believe changes in programs and practices will lead to changes in provider and patient behavior, which will lead to changes in overdose deaths. Obviously, the ultimate goal for PDO PFS are decreased rates of opioid abuse, decreased rates of emergency department visits due to misuse or abuse, and decreasing the overdose death rate. We know we can make progress because some states have already seen improvements by employing strategies like those outlined in PFS. For example, New York and Tennessee began requiring physicians to check their state's PDMP program before prescribing opioids. New York saw a 75% drop in patients who were seeing multiple prescribers for the same drug, so-called doctor shoppers, in one year. And Tennessee saw a 36% drop in the same outcome. On to guidelines real quickly. CDC is in the process of developing opioid prescribing guidelines for primary care providers for chronic pain outside of active cancer, palliative, and end-of-life care. Guidelines are needed to better align opioid prescribing practices in primary care settings, which can vary widely across the country, with the best available evidence to ensure safe, effective pain management. The guidelines will outline strategies for effective and safe, safe use of opioids when evidence demonstrates their benefits outweigh their risks. I want to mention that these guidelines are non-regulatory and do not represent the standard of care. Rather, they give providers recommendations that can inform their prescribing decisions. All the while, providers will have ample room to use their clinical judgment and address each patient on a case-by-case -case basis. CDC elected to develop guidelines for a number of reasons. For example, right now there are only a small number of high-quality guidelines, and those that do exist have some inherent weaknesses. Among them, they're outdated and do not incorporate new evidence. Not all used a systematic and scientifically rigorous process in development. There are concerns about conflict of, in of interest of some of the panelists, and none focused exclusively on primary care settings. The primary evidence informing the CDC guidelines comes from the AHRQ systematic review on the effectiveness and risks of long-term opioid treatment of chronic pain, released in September of last year. This review re rigorously addressed the effectiveness of long-term opioid therapy for outcomes related to pain, function, and quality of life, as well as the harms and adverse events associated with opioids. We updated this review with any new, new evidence that came out over the course of the last year. We developed the guidelines using the GRADE, or Grading of Recommendations Assessment, Development, and Evaluation Method. This approach specifies the systematic review of scientific evidence and offers a transparent approach to grading the quality of the evidence and setting the, st the strength of a recommendation. CDC is developing the guidelines using a rigorous and transparent four-step process. This included a core expert group, a stakeholder review group, public engagement, and peer review. The core expert group provided input on recommendation statements drafted by CDC to be included in the opioid prescribing guidelines. They met in late June. The, the core expert group included a number of primary care professional society representatives, subject matter experts, and state agency representatives. CDC selected members of the core expert group in a way to minimize conflict of interest, enhance objective assessment of the evidence, and reduce scientific bias. The stakeholder review group includes a larger group of 20 plus interested organizations that provided comments about the specificity applicability, and implementability of the recommendations. In this group, there was representation from professional organizations that represent specialists by which opioids are commonly prescribed. The group also includes represent representation from community stakeholders and advocacy organizations. Next, public engagement was solicited through two webinars. This allowed for uh, broader public input on the guidelines and for C CDC to consider public perspectives. Finally, the guidelines were sent to three peer reviewers and will go through a formal internal clearance process, which they're doing now. To date, CDC has received 1,200 comments and made 350 substantive changes to the guideline recommendations or the supporting text. The guidelines will be released in January of 2000, 
uh, 16, and broad dissemination is planned. The guidelines are still in, clear, in clearance, so I'm a little bit limited in what I can share. I will say that they address the determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain, opioid selection, dosage, duration, follow-up, and discontinuation, and assessing risks and addressing harms of opioid use. At the broadest level, three take-home messages for the guidelines will be the following. Non-opioid therapy should be preferred for chronic pain outside of end-of-life care. When opioids are used, the lowest possible effective dose should be prescribed to reduce the risk of opioid use disorders and overdose. As one of my colleagues puts it, start low and go slow. Providers should always exercise caution when prescribing opioids and monitor all patients closely using PDMPs and other means. In summary, overdose deaths from prescription drugs and heroin are at epidemic levels in the U.S. We have a better understanding of the drivers of the epidemic and the importance of addressing prescribing. A multifaceted and multi-sector approach is needed to achieve more progress, and interventions must be evaluated to determine the effectiveness and need for state-specific um, adaptation. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the Q&A, and let me turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldwin, for sharing that uh, overview of the CDC's effort and for your continued leadership. <clears throat> we'll now move into our panel of health plan speakers who will be sharing initiatives to address opioid abuse through clinical, pharmacy, and community efforts. Our first speaker will be Tom Kowalski. Tom has worked as a pharmacist in a variety of community settings before joining Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. As the Director of Clinical Pharmacy, he's responsible for the development, implementation, and management of clinical and safety programs for drugs in their pharmacy and medical benefits. Tom? Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'll move to my first couple of slides relatively quickly since I don't want to bore you and be repetitive. Uh, I just wanted to show you again what's, what our previous speakers have, sp have spoken about is uh, the epidemic both nationally and in Massachusetts of what we've seen historically. Um, and, and basically this is what has driven us to develop our program. Again, as you see, this slide, uh, uh, poisoning over deaths in Massachusetts in 2010 was almost 30 percent. Uh, again, something that was very alarming to us uh, and felt that um, caused us to, to take some action on what we did and how we w tried to develop a safety program for our members. Again, just another graphic, because I like pictures. Uh, but this is, you've heard this before, and again, just the cost and the, the number of people that this affects is just staggering. And we really felt from a health plan perspective as well as from a, a social perspective uh, out, um, that we really needed to do something that was impacting our members and our, our prescribers as well as our accounts. So if we look to look the next slide is what we actually uh, implemented our program in July 1st of 2012. Uh, and what we did was we really took a deep dive into our data and, and broke our data into short-acting opioids, those that have a duration of four to six hours, long-acting opioids, those that have duration of uh, 10 to 12 hours, and then we looked at our members using Suboxone. And what was really interesting for the majority of what we saw for short-acting is that it was being prescribed appropriately. It was you know, 11% uh, and most of them were getting a prescription for less than seven days. However, there were about 15% of them who were getting prescriptions for greater than 30 days, which we felt may be inappropriate in exposing them to a risk of addiction. When we looked at the long acting, we saw that it was again about 1% of the people using it. But what concerned us was that about 15% of them had a prescription for about 30 days. And it seemed to us that this was their first line of age, uh, first agent uh, of use. They did not show any short-acting opioids. And again, starting a uh, long-acting opioid before a short-acting opioid seemed inappropriate to us for somebody trying to treat an acute, uh, an acute uh, condition, which is what our data was showing us. And then finally, when we looked at our Suboxone members, we saw that about a third of them 
we're actually receiving these, these prescriptions from a variety of prescribers and pharmacies. And we felt that that was an issue in terms of continuity of care and were our members really receiving the best care by having to switch around or by switching around and what was the reason for that. So when we looked at our program, we had done a couple of different things on the management side. We had worked and had done formulary. We had done tier placement. We had done some quantity limits. We had done some prior ops on a drug here, on a drug there. We really didn't do anything comprehensive. We had a little bit of um, you know, management in place, but not much at all. But when we looked at the data, we really felt that we needed to come up with a comprehensive, all-encompassing plan that was going to address the issues we saw in a, in a smart uh, a way that did not interfere with uh, access to care or getting the medication when people actually needed it for the conditions they needed it. So we had three goals in mind. It was uh, make it affordable and accessible. Uh, we wanted to make pe sure that people had uh, appropriate pain care, that they weren't being denied access to it. So we actually excluded uh, anybody with cancer or a terminal illness from our program. And the other two components were, were primarily reduced at uh, decreasing addiction and diversion by decreasing the amount of prescription drugs dispensed at any one particular time. So those were our primary goals. And then uh, based on our consultation with experts uh, in the community, pharmacists, physicians, caregivers who were uh, working with people uh, either with addiction problems or treating chronic pain, uh, and working with our Mass Medical Society, our, um, our uh, Board of Pharmacy, uh, physicians, uh, osteopaths, emergency room physicians, um, and uh, addictionologists, we actually came up with a, a, a multi-pronged approach and, and, and listed on this page is the approach that we took and we put in place on July 1st, day one, uh, and put them all into place and, and away we went with the program. So first thing we did was we realized that uh, we still had some opioids going through mail order, so we, did, we didn't think it was an appropriate place for somebody to be getting a 90-day supply of drugs uh, of this caliber from mail order. So we blocked that. It was about 1,000 people that we uh, had uh, interrupted their therapy on and notified them that we were going to be changing this and they were going to have to go to uh, a local pharmacy in order to receive their medications. Next thing we did was uh, follow uh, the FDA guidelines and, and their recommendations, and we put a limit of four grams of acetaminophen per day on any combination prescription. So if people were getting either opioids or other medications that had uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen in it, such as uh, cough and cold medications, we put a limit that no more than four grams a day at the point of sale, that they were limited, limited to that. The next big component was our short-acting opioids. And what we did was we actually put in a uh, a point of sale edit that allowed a person to get up to two 15-day supplies of an opioid within a 60-day rolling period. Um, and after that, they would require prior off. Uh, and after a couple of months, we realized that some of the dentists who were actually prescribing appropriately, giving out two days here, then followed up by three days if pain still occurred, were hitting the block. So we actually modified that and allowed uh, multiple fills, um, but no more than 15 at, uh, at a time uh, for two supply, two 15-day supplies at a time within that rolling 60-day period. So again, they were able to get two 15-day supplies max uh, within that 60 days or uh, smaller increments as long as it didn't exceed that. Uh, next, we put a prior authorization on all long-acting opioids. So anybody who did not have a short-acting opioid uh, in the history of their claim system in the previous 120 days got hit with a prior auth. Prior auth at the point of sale uh, said, you know, must try a short-acting agent first or get prior auth. We also did for both of those prior auth programs, we allowed the pharmacist to dispense up to a three-day emergency supply. 
that way the, the member would go and at least be able to get a small amount uh, before having to go to a physician over the weekend or over a long holiday. Uh, and what we saw was the vast majority of the long-acting opioids did not pursue prior op, rather they switched to the short-acting opioids, and we saw actually about a 50% decrease in the use of long-acting opioids. We also developed an internal cross-functional team of pharmacists, nurses, physicians, our fraud unit, as well as our addictionologists um, and behavioral health folks to review outlier claims and actually work with physicians uh, and members uh, and determine if they needed to be locked down to a single prescriber or to a single pharmacy. Uh, and we've done that several times where necessary and communicated to the member that, you know, this is, this is how it is. If you're going to get this drug, this is where you have to go, and this is who you have to get it prescribed from. In addition, we put a prior authorization on buprenorphine, suboxone, and combination products uh, that anything over 16 milligrams a day required a prior authorization. We're knowing full well that the FDA dosing is up to 24 milligrams a day. Based on our, the work from our addictionologist, uh, we really felt that 60, at 16 milligrams, your mu receptors are saturated. You're not going to accept anymore. There really isn't a clinical need for it. And anything over 16 days in terms of a request that comes in through our pharmacy area goes to her. She has a consult with the prescribing physician. They come up with a treatment plan and come to terms whether it's uh, dose reduction or pill counting and actually works with the provider and, and checks back in with them every three months to make sure things are working. Uh, we also have sent out outlier reports, both the individual and group practices, to get them involved. We also did a change to our urine drug testing and put in annual limits because we saw an, uh, a, an overabundance of utilization on that. Uh, and finally, just recently, we uh, developed a, or are developing a series of educational videos that are put on by our medical directors for use with accounts um, and our municipalities, our uh, universities, uh, and some of our um, other labor and union groups so that they can see what it's all about. I, at the end, under the slides, I did list uh, the YouTube site if you want to see it and look at it. It's a couple minutes long, but it just it goes to show uh, the, the perils of becoming addicted and, and really what help there is available for, for one who falls into that. So finally, our safety uh, program, um, as I explained, it can, it, we reached out to a bunch of physicians. Our prior authorization was not really aimed at trying to save money, but was really aimed at education and aimed at uh, safety. So with each prior authorization, we required a, a treatment plan and attestation from the physician that they had looked at other options. Uh, that they actually had a signed consent uh, uh, on file with the patient for a risk assessment. They had an, an opioid agreement between the patient and prescriber outlining the expectations of both uh, and that they were willing to limit opioid prescribing to a single uh, pharmacy or single prescriber as, as clinically necessary. So since we rolled our program out um, three years ago, we actually had a, uh, a decrease in 21 million fewer doses of opioids being dispensed since we initiated the program. Again, I mentioned cat cancer patients and terminally ill patients are excluded, either based on um, the information provided to us through the prior auth or from claims uh, diags or from uh, claims history. We do have an addictionologist on staff who has been excellent uh, uh, consult for us with respect to reaching out to physicians. And in Massachusetts, naloxone, we do cover naloxone at Tier 1 at participating pharmacies that have a prescribing agreement with a, an on-call physician so that they can get it without a prescription. They can just walk in, get uh, get the two, two or three doses, whatever they're uh, order is for and then walk away with just their co-payment, no prescription necessary. So with that, it's references and uh, I will turn it back over. Uh, I know I have questions, but we'll hold those till later and I'll turn it back over to Catherine. Great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> 
Our next speakers join us from Tennessee. Dawn Abel is the Director of Community Relations for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, where she leads the research for grants and community investment opportunities and manages special initiatives serving communities. She's joined by one of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee's partners in stemming opioid abuse and the neonatal abstinence syndrome epidemic in Eastern Tennessee, Dr. Joji Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a family physician and medical director for Day Spring Family Health Center, a community health center located in the Appalachian Mountains. Dawn? Thank you very much, Catherine, for that introduction. And um, we, you know, Tennessee has already been mentioned a couple of times by several uh, by our speakers. Uh, the the drug addiction issue in Tennessee um, is, from from a community perspective, maybe encapsulated best by a statistic in 2014. More Tennesseans died from opioid overdoses than in car accidents or gunshots incidents. And so when we at the foundation were going through strategic planning a few years ago, um, the, the addiction issue jumped to the forefront as something that we should focus on. So from an enterprise perspective, we're doing a lot of things that are similar to what you'll see the other um, insurance providers doing. We, we do have a pain medication safety program that's actually modeled after the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts program. It includes elements like formulary controls, utilization management, physician education. Um, and, and in the foundation, we try to focus on investments that are complementary to what we're doing from an enterprise perspective. Our mission in the foundation is to be the leading proponent in the state for health and physical fitness. We bring together people, individuals, organizations, and resources to overcome barriers to better health, and then award grants strategically in three focus areas, access, activity, and addiction. And in the addiction focus, um, neonatal abstinence syndrome uh, became apparent as an issue to us when some of our community outreach, outreach workers brought to our attention the work that Dr. Thomas is doing in Campbell County, which is on the northern border of Tennessee, um, it, it, it straddles the border between Tennessee and, and Kentucky, so really close to Kentucky. Uh, opioid abuse and neonatal abstinence syndrome are um, just multiple times worse in that area of the state than they are in others, so that when Dr. Thomas's work was brought to us, um, we investigated and are, are trying to help him, support him and the work he's doing to reach out to his community uh, and I think Dr. Thomas will give us some more statistics about that. So at this time, I'll uh, hand it over to Dr. Thomas. Great. Thank you so much, Don and Catherine. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is uh, just go over our story and a little of what we are doing. First slide I want to show you is this is my home. This is Appalachia. We, uh, Day Spring is situated just like John said in the Tennessee Kentucky border. I've lived here for the past 15 years. I have lived in a small town of 2,000 people serving as a medical director for a community health center. Much like Doc Hollywood, I ended up in the rural south by happenstance. Um, and within days of arriving in the small little town of Jellico, I realized that the streets of Mayberry look quite different these days. What I was not prepared for was Tennessee's addiction to prescription drugs, but I had never seen so much drug use and abuse in my training. As a family doctor who does OB, I deliver babies, I do ultrasounds, I follow the moms and babies after the delivery. So what I saw was a terrible, terrible um, situation unfolding in front of me. This is um, Tennessee's drug epidemic. As you can see, it, it's by year. And you can see that we're getting more and more red. This is the amount of prescription drug use that we have. Um, the red counties are, um, are the highest rates of prescription drug use. Um, and you can see Tennessee's only gotten redder through the years. Um, increasing numbers of pregnant mothers were presenting to our clinics addicted to drugs. And what we saw within three days of delivery is these babies developed something called NAS, neonatal abstinence syndrome. They would shake with fevers and sweats. They're unconsolable. Their bodies are tight and stiff as a board, and they're poor feeders, vomiting frequently and gaining weight slowly. In essence, they're basically miniature addicts craving their next fix. 
So as this cohort grows older, we're anticipating a tsunami of development for delays, learning disabilities, and behavioral concerns. Unfortunately, the numbers don't bode well. This is um, a graph of Tennessee again um, uh, and our NAS. You can see in 2000 we had about 50 NAS hospitalizations in 2000, um, but that's increased to, to 973 in 2014. Um, that's pretty significant. Um, now, what is NAS costing us? If you can see on the top, um, at the cost of a normal non-NAS baby is $4,700 for its two-day nursery unit care. The cost of one NAS baby, however, is $62,000 for 26 days in our NICU. You all know quite well that this is pretty expensive, but if you look at them and multiply it by the number of babies that we've been having, in 2012 we had 736 babies. That cost us $46 million. Last year we had 973, and that came out to about $60 million. So basically, $60 million for 1,000 babies. Unfortunately, 60% um, of those NAS babies are born in my neck of the woods, um, uh, in uh, Region 1 and Region 2. And I'm right here in Claiborne and Campbell County. Um, we had 60%, basically 583 of the 973 babies born in the whole state was born in our backyard. This got the attention of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and three years ago, or several years ago, they came, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield came to our sleepy town trying to figure out what was in our water and how they could help us. That initial meeting birthed a think tank of people committed to addressing the growing needs of NAS in our community. One of the first things that we did was did something called the Voice of the Mothers, basically trying to figure out um, by interviewing these addicted mothers why they would do what they would do. I think that's that's a question that perplexes the general population. Why would these mothers who, who were just programmed, who, whose DNA is to protect their babies, why would they do such a, a terrible thing during their pregnancy? And over and over again, we hear the same desperate plight. They were, they were in a pit of fear, low self-worth, and complete distrust. Um, they were paralyzed by fear. They, weren't, they were fearful of going to jail, losing custody of their children. In Tennessee, there actually was a law last year that criminalizes um, and drug use in pregnancy if the mom doesn't get, uh, get help. And so this only perpetuated more of that fear. They were fearful it was too late and the damage was already done to their babies. These moms had terrible self-worth. They didn't feel like they deserved anything as, uh, and not, definitely not a precious baby. And finally, they live in distrust. They don't know who to believe or what, and who to trust. They're convinced that everyone has a secondary gain, um, including the doctors, including these pill mills. Um, they don't know who to trust, and so they're overwhelmed and lost. So where do they go? You know, what are their options? Basically, there's um, several bins that we call and that we um, put these moms in. Driven by fear, low self-worth, and distress, many of these addicted moms fall into these four buckets on the left. Um, increasing numbers were choosing to abort their babies. We, we, we don't do uh, abortions in our practice, but uh, many of these moms are coming to us and wanting, and wanting to abort their babies. Some choose to self-detox, which is rarely successful. Many of these, um, uh, out of sheer hopelessness, just continue abusing because they just don't feel like they can come off of it or don't feel the, it, that it's worthy. Unfortunately, a large number of them are ending up at our local pill mills who's, who's, who only worse in the addiction. Um, the local pill mill over here prescribes 24 milligrams of Suboxone along with Xanax um, uh, twice a day and now Neurontin three times a day to these pregnant mothers. Um, as you heard from the last speaker, 16 is the recommended dose, but they're getting 24 milligrams along with no pills and Neurontin. And unfortunately, the pull is to the left. It's not to the right to detox. It's not to maintenance therapy. But because these moms are driven by their their fear, their self-worth, and distrust, they're going towards the left, and that's and we are paying for that misguided behavior. Um, we really need to pull them to the right, which is to, to, to get them into good detox programs, to legitimate replacement programs, so that these, these babies are never withdrawn in the first place. And the way we do this is to make detox available, having a unified message that tells women that detox is safe. Until we start doing this, we will continue to leave significant amounts of money and watch countless lives destroyed. 
What needs to happen is we need to change the message that detox is safe in pregnancy. We need to develop a comprehensive integrated program that is sustainable for providers and makes sense for patients. Um, the first is change the message. Why not detox? The truth is, is that our current standard not to detox women is based on two case reports from the 1970s, two patients, unfortunately. Um, basically, in the 1970s, two really um, uh, well-known uh, doctors wrote two case reports. Mentoria and Nunez basically wrote on a stillbirth that happened two days after a mother went through a heroin withdrawal. The second was a, um, uh, was a case report by Zuspan, who is the forefather of maternal fetal medicine, basically uh, in documenting increased epinephrine levels in amniotic fluid in pregnancy um, of a mother that was going through withdrawal. So basically, our, our um, current standards are based off of 1970s data on two case reports. Since 1990, there have been five different studies with a total of 383 women who were detoxed that showed no fetal deaths. Um, and uh, right now, there's actually a really good study going on at UT that continues to prove that over and over again. And I can't talk much about that study right now because they are in the midst of getting published. Um, and, but the idea is that detox is safe and that we should do it, and that there aren't any um, untoward effects. Goal number two is that we really need a comprehensive integrated care um, uh, that's available to these moms. We need something that's team-based, that integrates behavioral health into our OB care. We need an antepartum care that really surveil, uh, surveillance of these moms during this high-risk uh, time. So doing MSGs, doing ultrasounds, doing high-risk OB doing postpartum care and offering voluntary reversible long-acting contraceptives that these, these moms don't turn around and get pregnant again. And then, of course, um, we'd love to offer something um, to partner and family inpatient detox um, the whole group, uh, ideally so that the mom who's cleaned up doesn't go back to a home that's ridden with drugs. Um, what, would, what would it look like if we were able to detox these moms, but while we were detoxing the moms, detox the partners and clean up the home, whole home as we get along? I want you to look at this next uh, screen here. Um, it's the cost savings of detox, um, which a lot of people don't talk about. Um, the top is what happens if we detox the mom. If we detox the mom, it takes 10 days to detox, and that's, uh, that's what we would offer. Um, and it would cost about $7,500 for that 10-day program. If we just detox just 300 moms, that's about a third of Tennessee's addicted mothers, we would, um, it would cost $2,250,000. As what it takes to care, uh, take care of that general baby, we're talking about a total of $3.7 million on moms that were detoxed. Compare that to the NAS cost of taking care of 300 um, withdrawing babies. That's $18.6 million. If we detox 300 moms, we would save $15 million just on 300 babies. Um, that's pretty significant. Our practice, um, our vision is to open a center for addiction help and resources. We're in the process of going through the final stages of it. We're looking at opening a regional center of excellence um, with inpatient and outpatient detox, having integrated behavioral health um, on our outpatient as well as our inpatient sites, having aftercare services that basically equip these moms um, so that um, they've got a life afterwards, that they've got some good parenting skills, that they've got you know, some you know, marriage skills. Um, we'd love to offer um, voluntary, voluntary reversible long-acting contraceptives that these, these moms don't turn around and re-enter the system with another pregnancy. And, and, and really, one of the biggest things that we're having the hardest time is pushing is trying to get other people in the family detox at the same time. Um, pregnancy is a great time to get everyone on board. One last thing that I want to share with you all is this fragmentation of care. Um, this is what I've learned through the years, that we are just fragmented, and we are just entrenched in, in fragments and cycles of care. Instead of seeing pregnancy and a newborn as a full cycle of care, we have broken it up into different levels, structured by different specialties. Each specialist is, is motivated to get his or her um, uh, baby out of the system and out of their practice. When we're doing OB care, the OB wants the healthy mom and baby, so he kicks the addicted mother to the high risk. Um, the maternal fetal medicine wants a viable baby, so she quickly hands that withdrawing baby to the NICU staff. 
the neonatologist wants, wanting the baby to stop withdrawing as soon as he can, does what he can, and hands the baby over to the pediatrician who's left with the child with long-term behavioral and developmental issues. I don't think anyone's looking at that full cycle of care. As a family doctor who does this all the time, this is my world. I'm taking care of the mom, the addiction, the baby, and the consequences. And we, we are basically just kicking the can, or really the baby in this case, down the road for someone else to deal with. We're transferring unhealthy consequences at a significant cost downstream. What we need is a comprehensive, integrated approach that looks at this whole cycle and not fragmented uh, and fragmented to different people. We need to look at not just NES, but the whole mom, the whole family, the whole care, and, and bring peace um, to that system. And that's all. That's all I can share. Again, thank you so much for allowing me this privilege to share. Thank you, and thank you so much, Dr. Thomas and uh, Don, for sharing your efforts <clears throat> in Tennessee. Um, Nickham has been working uh, with Don and her colleagues uh, at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee to put together a fact sheet highlighting uh, many of their efforts to address NAS in Tennessee, and we'll be releasing that later today. Our next speaker of this afternoon is Julie Snyder. She's Vice President Corporate Relations at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York. Uh, she provides strategic leadership for corporate communications, media relations, and key corporate initiatives, including uh, an impressive uh, prescription drug abuse awareness campaign that she's going to share with us this afternoon. Julie? Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome from sunny, warm Buffalo, New York. It's 59 degrees, and we have no snow. Um, just a little background on our Blues Plan. Uh, we uh, have been in the community since 1936 and cover about 800,000 lives. Health Now New York is the parent company. And um, our market, just to give some background, our 2010 census, which is the most recent complete uh, data on the Buffalo Niagara MSA puts us at about 1.1 million. Um, and just some statistics about our region, uh, including the fact that Niagara Falls, New York, uh, has a very large air reserve station. We also have significant private sector employment. And although we are enjoying an economic and cultural renaissance, I don't think the Buffalo Bills can, uh, can be counted in that. Um, about three years ago, uh, we became aware uh, as a health plan of an alarming trend. Uh, some of the statistics are uh, statistics that have already been shared on this webinar. What really galvanized us uh, was around the use of painkillers by teenagers. Basically, uh, understanding the statistic uh, that more than half of the abusers of prescription pain meds are between the ages of 12 and 25, and a generation of kids really raised uh, feeling very sort of safe and secure in using meds, a very different generation uh, than the one before. And this came home for us as a health plan. Really, it started with one. It started with one parent coming to us about their son, uh, an architecture student with Crohn's disease who was prescribed into addiction. And ultimately, uh, that addiction led to heroin and ultimately to his suicide. And uh, the father's plea, Avi Israel, was uh, that uh, as a health plan, we were one of many stops where he came for help. And at the end of the day, he said, if we can do one thing, uh, it would be to educate the community and educate uh, especially young adults and their parents about the risks of prescription pain meds. He wasn't alone, and I know many uh, people on this webinar probably watched the 60 Minutes episode yesterday on what's going on in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, it's a story that's repeating itself pretty much everywhere. Uh, young adults uh, who have become addicted and ultimately go to heroin, and it's a short runway to suicide. 
So as a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, uh, we felt that uh, because there was such little awareness that we would launch a community awareness campaign. And uh, unique, we started with the medical community because we did not want to sort of demonize uh, the, the provider community that, as you all know, had been really moved away from uh, grinning and bearing it when it came to pain, to pain management to making sure that patients, uh, really all patients, regardless of what their diagnosis was, did not have pain. We went around and saw community and media buy-in. We created a middle school-based curriculum, again, trying to get upstream uh, to get uh, sort of a way to stop children from even trying pain meds, and worked with our PBS affiliate to fund a fairly compelling documentary, really to launch dialogue uh, throughout our region. We also found that there was a great need for a 24-7 hotline um, that could help parents or individuals, sort of a single stop where they could go to get help. We partnered with a local health provider to do that. We raised funds to really finance the, the overall campaign. We decided not to go um, through government channels, but rather the private sector and local foundations. We were not going to ad really focus on advocacy. We wanted to really keep this very uh, contained to be an awareness campaign. And we definitely leveraged our brand in the community uh, to step into an issue that really was not something uh, that anybody else was covering. Uh, the response just from going out and uh, talking to media partners and our agency of record uh, was overwhelming. Everyone said yes. Everyone said yes. We didn't get one no. And everyone had a story. Uh, there wasn't one meeting we had, and we probably had 50 or 60 meetings in the community uh, to start to launch the campaign. Everyone at the end of every meeting would pull some, one of us aside and say, this is going on in my family. And I thought that that was... Um, that was very telling for us. So we called it Project Hope. Um, again, all of the elements uh, that we envisioned really came to pass, including information cards that we created for pharmacies and doctor's offices, aggressive PR. We launched a website the, and the hotline, as previously discussed. And what I thought I would do is just share the elements of the creative campaign. And um, I know I'm going to have help from my friends at NICM for this. The first thing we're going to play is the 30-second television commercial uh, that we produced. And it's one of four, actually, but we'll play this first. There are two things you need to know about prescription painkillers. The first is that they're good for relieving pain after surgical or dental procedures. The second is that they're opiates, just like heroin, strong enough to take away any pain. Except sadly, the kind that comes with losing a child to painkiller addiction. Know the facts. Visit painkillerskill.org today. Okay, uh, the next, I'm not sure if that, um, if someone, Karen or someone on the conference, can you confirm that, that that TV spot was able to be seen? We could see it. Okay, great. So the next item is um, a 60 second radio spot, and again, I'll just assume you can hear the audio. There are lots of ways to have a killer party. Taking prescription drugs like hydrocodone, oxycotton, or Lortab shouldn't be one of them. Because while you may think that prescription drugs are safer than street drugs, the fact is they're not. Prescription painkillers like these are opiates. Just like heroin, they have the same effect on the human brain as heroin, and they are just as addictive as heroin. That means it won't take long before those pills get a hold of you, and once you're hooked, your life will never be the same. 
So think twice before you take someone else's prescription meds at a party. And don't bring your prescriptions or your parents to share with others. Because a killer party is great. But a party that ultimately kills a promising future? That's another thing altogether. For more information on the dangers of prescription drug abuse, visit painkillerskill.org today. Thank you. And then uh, I'm just going to share an uh, introduction of our documentary that was produced locally by our PBS affiliate. And I'll hit play here, I hope. Prescription pills are floating around high schools like pencils and textbooks. Even though you may try and get away from it, in your sleep, it will speak to you. Every 19 minutes in this country, we lose a person to opiates. Once known as the quiet epidemic, painkiller addiction is taking the lives of our young Prescription pills are floating around high schools like pencils and textbooks. Even though you may try and get away from it, in your sleep, it will speak to you. Okay, I'm not Every sure. 19 minutes um, in this country, we lose a person to opiate. Catherine, if we want to just move on, then we can provide this link again. Sure, yeah, we have the links um, in the slides up on our website. So if, if you couldn't hear the audio um, or see it, people can go and take a look at the videos. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting some messages too that there's, um, can't hear the audio. So we'll make sure that we have those links available to you afterwards. And I do apologize, best, best intentions. But we had many elements in the, uh, in the campaign. This is uh, a picture of the outdoor uh, billboards that were very uh, prevalent throughout western New York, probably for ni about 90 to 120 days, and we had great placement um, with, our, with our media partners. Um, we also launched this with a very large media event at a local college and uh, had this display both at the college as well as reproduced it for the different middle schools for the curriculum. And we also, I believe, had this on site for our own workforce to, to sign their name to that pledge. These are the information cards uh, that actually uh, virtually every pharmacy in Western New York was more than happy to stock these cards at their counters. Um, as you can imagine and probably are aware, uh, more armed robberies are occurring in retail pharmacies than in banks, at least in Western New York. And so these cards uh, are being used and distributed uh, at pharmacies, at physicians' offices, and most recently by the Western New York Labor Council, um, which has really endorsed the campaign. So we wanted to just increase awareness and provide education to the medical community, increase awareness of the issue to our community at large, and really provide a resource to parents and young adults. And uh, after we did the campaign in 2013 into early 14, we surveyed, and people certainly uh, recalled seeing the campaign and uh, that indeed it did achieve its primary goal, which was to increase awareness. Um, out of it, uh, from the survey, many consumers recognize that painkillers are addictive, and up to a third stated that uh, painkillers are a synthetic form of heroin. Action taken not as encouraging. 62% had not done anything as a result, but 20% discussed the topic. About the same number expired, uh, got rid of expired drugs, and about 10% had conversation. The campaign, and I think that uh, as we talk about the campaign, uh, the, the real impact was the fact that there were not really many widespread public awareness campaigns that linked painkillers to ultimately to death. 
And I think because of that and the timing of the campaign, uh, our agency of record, Eric Mower and Associates and Blue Cross Blue Shield submitted the campaign both locally, state, and for a few national uh, awards. And we were really uh, humbled that the campaign was met uh, with such widespread um, um, you know, recognition. But really, there's more to be done. Uh, I don't at all want to act like the campaign achieved phenomenal results, because we are still in the midst of an epidemic in western New York. And this is the headline from about a month ago, Sunday paper. Uh, along with stories. So we've had 147 opiate-related overdoses so far in our county and predicting about 275 by year-end. So we still very much are in the midst of this and um, the statistics are listed there, at least for our market. And I also would say there's more to be done because, it, you know, these are three of the hundreds of young adults whose lives have been lost um, because of this. The next steps are really being done in conjunction with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association that has aligned and endorsed this local campaign and in fact is funding now a national documentary that will be produced by uh, WNED but sponsored by the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and available for use and broadcast in other PBS markets throughout the country. So that's uh, a look, and I, and I do apologize that the, the creative from the campaign uh, did, not, uh, did not launch or was visible, but I will tell you that it, uh, it probably has been one of the more rewarding uh, things that we have done at this health plan, and um, we're very honored to be included in today's webinar. Thanks so much, <clears throat> Julie. We appreciate you sharing your efforts. Um, and as I mentioned, the, uh, we could see the video on our end. It might depend on people's internet speeds, but we do have that on our website with Julie's slides, so you can go um, take a look at it. And it will also be in the recording of this event as well. So we've heard about uh, many promising efforts today, the federal level, um, and from health plans in their states and communities committed to preventing prescription drug abuse and overdose, um, and we're excited to now turn into our Q&A session with our audience of healthcare decision makers. <clears throat> um, you can continue to submit questions um, via the Q&A chat box. And I'll start out, Julie, actually a question uh, for you. A couple people were interested in the school curriculum and community uh, media resources, and we're curious if there's a way to see the curriculum, or if you have any sort of resources you could point people to who might be interested in developing something similar. The middle school curriculum is, I don't believe it's online. You can go to painkillerskill.org, which is the general site for the campaign. And uh, there may be a tab there for further information, but I can also get the curriculum and provide that as a link through NICM. Great, thank you. Um, a question related to NAS, um, uh, how do we protect women while at the same time providing timely treatment for newborns? And what are your thoughts on universal maternal testing on admission to labor and delivery um, or universal cord testing of newborns? And is anyone doing this type of screening? I don't know if Dr. Thomas or CC could speak to that. So our practice does do universal testing. We test at a clinic as well as and the hospital itself. But we've got a really cool um, process of handling all positive tests. Um, and we've got a protocol that's developed. I, I think when we first started this about eight, ten years ago, um, we started testing positive, and then as soon as we test positive, we would refer patients out to high risk. And you know, we did exactly the last slide that I did, which is basically just on the mouth. But that wasn't the best care um, because those patients actually ended up not going for any further referrals. 
and um, ended up coming back on higher doses of medicines because they got it from pill mills or from the clinics. So the thing is, if you're going to test them, do you have a way of, of dealing with them? Do you have a care manager, a navigator, or a counselor, or a behavioral therapist that can help walk them through it, um, especially when they tell you it's not my drug, it's, uh, it's not my urine, it's someone else's, I smelled. Um, uh, cocaine out there, and I must have gotten that way. Um, the bigger question is not that you are you screening; it's it's what do you do when it's positive, and do you have a comprehensive, integrative system that cares for those patients that are positive? And by the way, uh, ACOG does not um, currently have any recommendations to do universal screening um, yet. Um, that is something that they've talked about, but um, I. I I don't, uh, I don't know of any recent recommendations to ACOG to do universal drug screens. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, another uh, question that came in was about um, reducing administrative or other barriers to the um, non-drug therapies to treat pain, and um, I think Grant touched on this briefly, and um, could any of the speakers sort of expand on how we can help facilitate access uh, to other treatments? Hi, this is Cece. Uh, I think that that's one of the things that um, will be being examined as part of the presidential memorandum. Um, and, you know, obviously in order for there to be more um, more alternative treatments available, there needs to be um, demonstration of their efficacy, but also um, support for them by payers. And, um, you know, we would really like to see that kind of thing um, be supported. There's been a number of efforts to, um, to make those be more useful. Um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has had a, um, a pain um, computerized therapy program that Lisa Marsh at Dartmouth University has worked on with Dennis Turk, who is a very, um, very prominent pain researcher, uh, to develop a direct to the patient, patient pain management program um, based on cognitive behavioral skills, because it is very hard to um, train therapists to do that kind of, um, of work. And um, those are the kinds of things that we need to have payment models um, for. And I know that uh, the VA has done a great deal as far as trying to get alternatives available. And um, so that might also be something to, to look at is um, what have they done. I know they've gotten a, um, a federal employment code for acupuncturists, which were not previously uh, available in the federal government. Um, and now they're employing acupuncturists, for example, for pain. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, another question is that some of the speakers mentioned risk assessment as part of a protocol to help with the addiction problem. Um, are there any strategies to help uh, promote and um, to help facilitate physicians to use a formalized risk assessment when they have limited time with the patient? This is, this, Go ahead. This is Grant Baldwin from the CDC. I mean, I think one um, essential strategy for, for all providers to use is to check the, the prescription drug monitoring program uh, prior to scripting an opioid. So um, I think I indicated in my presentation that um, state PDMP laws vary quite dramatically across this country, and, and the ones that are most robust require uh, clinicians to, to check the PDMP. Uh, if not in every prescription, certainly when prescribing um, the first opioid and at, at uh, duration. So checking the PDMP is a key risk, risk mitigation strategy. This is Cece. Another thing that I was going to say is that um, there have been a number of, um, of materials that have been developed as part of prescriber education process. And I think there's something on the SAMHSA website that we can get you a link for um, that relates to how to um, prescribe if somebody has had a history of substance use disorder. Um, also, I attended recently an excellent training um, that Boston University had developed um, called the Scope of Pain. 
training, and it is for um, physician providers. It offers a, um, or any kind of prescriber, it offers a um, continuing education credit, and I believe they have the, those modules online. Um, and that really goes extensively through how to do um, risk assessment on patients and, and make determinations based on, um, you know, a, a case study um, approach to how you would, um, would prescribe for a patient. Great, thank you. Um, a few additional questions for Julie uh, regarding your campaign in New York. Could you talk about the social media presence as well as a little bit more um, about the survey that you conducted and sort of, uh, you know, how did you, um, what population was targeted to evaluate your campaign? I'll start with the latter question first. The, um, the awareness campaign was literally a, a, a sort of bread and butter public awareness campaign. So it was not a campaign that we directed just to our members nor through our employer groups or GBAs. It was really using the force of all the separate media channels and outlets to blanket the community with a, an awareness campaign. As a result of that, the survey panel was a community survey panel. And so we just literally went out to, you know, the general public using one of our market research survey firms to conduct the research. Um, and so that's really um, the background on that. We did use social media, and uh, we actually have Horizon, uh, which is one of our partners in the campaign, managing our Facebook and Twitter accounts for Painkillers Kill. I believe the Twitter handle is Pain Meds Kill. Um, and uh, the Facebook page is Painkillers Kill. I did see a question about why we were targeting uh, young adults when the majority of addiction uh, seems to be people beyond the teen years. And we really felt that um, if we didn't start speaking to youth that this was going to just continue to increase and that many health, otherwise healthy young adults were, were being prescribed into addiction unknowingly and that young adults and parents and caregivers needed to be aware that this was going on. Um, there were just too many anecdotal examples that came out from the conversations and the focus groups that we had about um, story after story of young adults going to pill parties and that prescription meds taken from parents' medicine cabinets were most often what was targeted, um, parents and grandparents. So we felt that this was, in fact, a target audience that we needed to go after. And we were certainly aware that addiction is um, hitting many other age groups and demographics, but we wanted to focus on young adults because our obituary pages are full of young adults that have passed away, and um, it felt very reminiscent of the AIDS, AIDS epidemic when AIDS first came and people's young children were dying, and um, these obituaries would run, and you would have no idea why these, at that time, why these young men were dying, and it's very similar in western New York um, when you look at the, the death notices. So we knew that young adults were uh, a group that we needed to target. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Thomas, we had a, a few other questions come in um, wanting more information about um, your program and uh, talking about the, the opportunities for detoxing during pregnancy. Um, I'll just read off a, one or two of them and <clears throat> you can take it from there. Um, if a woman has tried and failed detox, would uh, she have the option to continue uh, the medication-assisted treatment without ramification? The other question is, um, would the detox from heroin uh, happen without use of methadone or Suboxone? So, um, so the program that we're developing here is using Suboxone for that 10-day period and basically weaning. Um, it's a rapid wean over 10 days and in that process, um, connecting the patient with um, counselors and behavioral health 
but then also connecting them with a, DC, a, a um, DCS liaison um, so that they'll have some connection going forward um, and then eventually getting them involved with AA or um, NA. Um, that's what we're developing. Now there's going to be different scenarios. There's going to be people that want to be, uh, and our goal is to get them down to zero. There are people that we know that probably can't get down to zero. We are seeing that more and more that patients will get down to two and four and can't get past that. And those are the people that I think would be ideally set up for a maintenance type of program. Um, and, um, and, and this ideally would, be, would work for patients who are on heroin or methadone or suboxone or street drugs to get them in, get them cleaned up, and then get them on the lowest dose, ideally again, the, the being zero, uh, but I think there is a place for maintenance therapy going forward as well. So um, how we do that, um, we're still developing it right now, um, working with Blue Cross Blue Shields uh, Foundation to, to make that happen. We're working with High Risk OB as well. Um, like I said, High Risk OB at Knoxville has great data that shows that they've been detoxing that woman to zero without, an, un, without any untoward effects towards the baby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, and to all of our speakers. Um, we, uh, we are at uh, our stop time, so I did want to thank our speakers. I want to give you all an opportunity if you have a, a quick closing word or thought you'd like to leave us with, and then we'll wrap up the event. If I can just say one thing, this is Dr. Thomas. Um, if I can just say one thing, one um, is that I, I, the whole idea needs to be integrative. Um, what we're finding is that um, we've broken things up so people aren't paying. Um, well, even in getting reimbursed for detox therapy, what, what the hospital reimbursement is for a detox program is very, very minimal compared to a detox program for high-risk people. So if we really are serious about detoxing them and getting them off of it and then keeping them off of it, we've got to think bigger. We've got to think about detoxing the families. We've got to talk about um, giving them contraceptives afterwards so they don't come back pre pregnant. We've got to talk about, um, uh, about reimbursing hospitals better so that there's an incentive to do programs like this. Um, the truth is detox is safe. Um, we just need to, to, to develop an infrastructure for that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. This is Grant Baldwin from the CDC. The only thing I, I want to sort of amplify what CC had said earlier and invite people to visit hhs.gov forward slash opioids. Um, all the federal government's resources related to opioids are showcased there. Great. Thank you. Hi, and this is CDC, and I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for attending the webinar and um, that currently uh, a lot of these programs um, related to NAS are beginning to, um, to crop up, but methadone um, and to some extent buprenorphine have, um, for maintenance, have been shown over time consistently to be safe for mothers and the vast majority of the data that we have available, and we don't have very long-term data, but does seem to suggest that these infants um, do not um, experience extreme difficulties long-term, that they are capable, um, given a stable family environment, of um, improving their cognitive outcomes. Um, so, you know, I think that um, in the absence of extremely supportive um, programs following detox, currently our gold standard is um, medication-assisted treatment. And that goes for opioid use disorder generally, and um, that's all I've got. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Cece. Tom or Julie? No, I, I did just send you the link. The entire middle school curriculum, which is very comprehensive, is available through our PBS affiliate site and the specific URL I sent to Catherine, and we can embed it in the deck uh, before it's available. So thank you. Thanks, Julie. <coughs> Well, thank you um, again to our panel of speakers and our audience for joining us today. We will have a recording available as well as the slides, and we also ask if you'll take a moment to share feedback from this event. And thank you all again for joining us.